Welcome to a Jumpers and Bumpers special. Who would have thought back in 1975 when Hit Parade won a lowly selling hurdle down at Taunton, the unknown trainer would go on then to train 4,000 winners and be champion trainer on 15 occasions. He totally revolutionised the art of training racehorses, largely down to interval training on this very gallop. But that's enough of me wishing on. Let's go meet the great man. Now, Martin, by my calculations, it's 12 years since you retired, and you still can't leave it. You've got screens around here, you've got cameras in stables on the gallops. Um, obviously, I've got to keep an eye on David, <laughs> keep a check on him so that I can see what's going, I can see whether the horse walker's working, how the horses are in the stable, keep an eye on everything. It's still a big part. You still enjoy it, then? I still enjoy it, definitely. Let's start off, because you, you went to school. You've always been in, in the Taunton area, haven't you? Always lived in, uh, born in Wellington, lived in Taunton all my life, uh, in Wellington Hospital I was born, and uh, my father was a bookmaker. And were you, were you any good at school? Useless. <laughs> Come on. No, no good at school. What, no subjects? I was good at mathematics, only interested in mathematics. I used to come home and uh, Dad had an illegal betting shop at the house and I used to try and settle the bets and work out things. I'd, I'd take all the bets at the school on Grand National Day and things like that. The Latin master would have half a crown each way on something mm -hmm. connected to a Latin horse or something. And uh, so I took all the bets. They thought I was putting them on, but I was laying them. <laughs> <laughs> did, 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 you, did you enjoy school then? Were you, were you a good No, pupil? I did, didn't enjoy school. I, I thought you'd be a good learner, though. I thought you'd enjoy it. I enjoyed sport. OK. I enjoyed sport, playing cricket, rugby. Um, that, that was good fun. Wednesdays and Saturday afternoons, it was great, but um, not, not, not very attentive, really. No. That not surprised attentive. me in a lot of ways. I wasn't any good at geography or history, but mathematics, I loved mathematics. And for some reason, I just was good at figures. Yeah, well, which is, which is handy with your father being, with being a bookmaker. That, that's right, that's right. And so, <laughs> come on, tell us, tell us about him, because whenever I read an article or whenever I you know, we read anything about you, your father is such a prominent figure. He was very demanding, um, worked me very hard. I wasn't allowed to have holidays. Um, I, I would go and work in the office and check the football pools in, in the evening, and the, the football coupons when we used to do and things like that. But I, I really enjoyed it. Mm. I really enjoyed it, but um, basically I had to do what he said. Never allowed to travel anywhere, never allowed to go anywhere. Well, what do you mean? What, not, not, not really. And, and, then, and then I wanted a car, I wasn't allowed a car. That eventually, I bought myself a car when I was 17 and completely smashed it up and everything like that. <laughs> finished up in hospital, so... <laughs> Did you? Um, well, not surprised around these lanes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was in Taunton. Oh, God. But um, it is, he was very good. And you had to be good at what you did. Um, I used to work in the betting shop. As soon as I left school, I put my hand up at school. What do you want to be when you, when you leave? A bookmaker. And everybody laughed, you know, they didn't know what a book he was, really, and they, they all laughed. But So I went and worked in the betting shop. He used to sweep the floor, and I took a pride in sweeping the floor. You had to be perfect. Yeah. Nothing was out of place. You had to, and then I used to do the board and things like that, and take bets and settle bets and do all that sort of stuff. And it was, it was really fascinating and really exciting. And you get to Grand National Day, all the bets you took... It was just unbelievable. Watching the liabilities all the time, that's quite that's nerve wracking. Right. And then Dad used to go away to the races, and eventually, when I was old enough, I used to be on the field sheet. All right. And used to work it out, you know, and you had to, it used to be cop and, and blow, win and lose, you see. So I'd do the figures, and he'd say, go to the races. And he'd phone up after every race, every half an hour, from the phone box at New Number Races or wherever, whatever meeting he was, to see what damage I'd done. <laughs> <laughs> So I do that. It's a, I remember one day in particular, it was a horse called Campbell Slang. It won the Air Gold Cup or something. Um, and I'd, we took thousands of pounds. Thousands and thousands of pounds. We had big punters, very big punters, honestly. And uh, taking all the bets, all taking all the bets. And listening to the commentary. It was only on the commentary in those oh, yeah, days. No yeah. pictures, nothing. Listening. And it's not there. It's not in the, it's not, it's not in the frame. One finishing fast, Campbell Slang. <laughs> 
And I've stood it for far, far, far too much money. And it's won. Oh, damn. Oh. Did you go mad? So I'm ill. <laughs> so I wrangled, <laughs> wrangled the, the field sheet and put, like, cop low, 22 grand or something like I put down, like, on so and so. And uh, dad came back in the evening and said, uh, You're not very good at adding up, are you? <laughs> <laughs> he checked it all. It was near a 52. He oh, said, you can't, you can't add up, can you? You don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so I, I used to be, uh, take chances, big chances. So, so was, he, was, he, was he a self-made man? What, what was his father? What was his um, line of work? How did he become a bookmaker? How did he become a bookmaker? He, he was like a pig farmer early on in oh, okay. his life. Um, wanted to do a job, and then he went to work for a bookmaker, and he used to bet. He used to go to the Greyhounds, he used to bet, and he used to lose. And he thought, I don't like this. <laughs> I don't like this. I want to be that man there, taking all the bets. And that's how, what he told me, and how eventually he came to be a bookmaker, taking the bets. So he started taking the bets. And when betting shops came in, um, I'm not sure when it was, 1960-something, um, we had all... We had some illegal betting shops at the house anyway. Well, the army camp used to come up and, <laughs> and do that, and they all played cricket with me, and both we had cricket nets at the back. And um, he'd take all the bets, and then we had betting shops everywhere. We were the biggest in the West Country. And uh, eventually he sold out. Yeah, and did very well at it. He's, but he's, a, he's a, a, a touch of a sort of Arthur Daly character, wasn't he? You know, he certainly he'd was. Buy, he'd buy anything, you know. <laughs> he'd buy anything. And, and be successful yes. at it. Yes, he, he was very good at... Um, yeah, getting value, I suppose. He'd buy everything second-hand, goodness knows what. Yeah. He wouldn't buy a new car, but he did eventually buy a new car once. Uh, <laughs> bought an Aston Martin. And, did he? Uh, um, he? He had it like for about three days and drove it on the road and thought, that's 15 grand I've lost <laughs> straight away or something, and he didn't appreciate it, and it got lost anyway. <laughs> is he, is he quite, was he quite hard on you? He's very hard on me, yes, very hard. Was he? So in, in a funny sort of a, you know, a strict childhood that you had then? Very strict. Very strict it was, very and strict. So, so you're always, you always wanted to be a bookmaker, is that what...? That I wanted to be a bookmaker, and that's it. So he sold all the business, mm. and uh, so I'm left out of a job. <laughs> he wouldn't let me go and join William Hill, who, who he sold to. Um, and I remember we had a letter one day from John Brown. He said, it's a good job you never came to work for us. It's a lovely letter. He said, because you'd have had my job. <laughs> <laughs> he really did. He came down and did the deal with that and everything like that. Um, I said, loads of betting shops. Um, so I'm out of a job, so I thought, what can I do? I always wanted to ride, so I thought I'd be a jockey. So, so how old were you at this stage? I'm probably 18, 19. OK. I thought I'd be a jockey. And had, you ever, had you ever ridden pony? Uh, had never, a pony? never ridden at all. Nothing. Never ridden nothing, at all? Nothing, nothing. I thought I'd be a jockey. So I wangled a licence, just for point to pointing it was. They gave me a licence, for you could get a licence. and uh, So I had a ride in the point to point. And uh, they gave me a horse which was similar to Desert Orchid, if you yeah, like. Yeah. It, but it wasn't, but it was just that good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I, I rode this horse around the point to point, and I got round. Who trained him then? Um, it was a friend of ours, oh, okay, Raymond okay. Olfer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I got round on this horse called Faber's Town, which um, was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, you yeah. know, won loads of races. And I, I, I must have wobbled from side to side. I was absolutely useless. <laughs> I got around and finished about the seventh. I thought, oh, that's good, that's easy. And then I, the next ride, they put me on a novice. And, of course, they're different. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> so we get to the novice, bang, 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 on the floor. I fell off. I was totally utter rubbish. <laughs> I'm sure you were. I, I, I made you look good. <laughs> I well, say that. <laughs> again, that wasn't hard. <laughs> the, um, so, so, but you did ride a winner, didn't you? Oh, yes. Can I tell you about it? Yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, you <laughs> can tell us about it. We haven't got long enough. <laughs> no, no um, uh, so I, I rode these horses, but I fell off all the time. And then I rode, Dad bought a nice horse called Weather Permitting. Okay. Uh, from Ascot Sales. Um, it was tailor made, basically. And so I thought, and I told everybody, I'd ridden it round uh, Minehead the week before, and it finished third to Ottaway. And it was not Blimey. off. All of the cards. <laughs> so it was served to a Gold Cup winner. Yeah. Um, it won the... Um, Horse and Hound Gold Cup. Oh, yes, and the Whitbread yes. as and well. And the Whitbread. And yeah, the Whitbread. Yeah. So, and I told everybody, I'd never ridden the winner, and I told everybody, I I'm going to win next week, I'm going to win next week. I remember telling my auntie, everywhere I'm going to win. So there's about 10, 15 runners in, in, in the race. And uh, so we rode it round, uh, I forget where it was now, Bishop's something. 
Bishop's Lee. Bishop's Lee, that's right. And I rode it round, and uh, I hit the front. There was an odd song shot in the race. I thought, what do I do now? What do I do now? I just went on and won. And all the bookmakers cheered, honestly. They, they all <laughs> cheered because they, they knew what an idiot I was, <laughs> and I won. So it was, it was a great feeling. Do you um, think that helped you? The, the fact that you've ridden OK, you know, not very much, but you rode a bit, do you think that helped you in your it, it training career? It, it definitely helped. It, it's nice to, to do it. Um, it taught me how to train horses. It taught me how, how to... Uh, I, when I had my first ride, uh, I had a hunter, and we just put a, a, a pole across there, um, only a, a beanstick pole, and no wings, no nothing, and he jumped, he'd jump it because he was brilliant. That's, that's all I jumped before I jumped the fence. Um, so it taught me to school horses properly, and I, I never let the lads ride horses that I, I rode. No. You know, horses that I would have ridden because uh, they need schooling properly. When did you really start to believe, I want to train horses? When, when was that? You had your first winner point of pointing. When did you start? So uh, I broke a leg at Taunton Races. Okay. Uh, went out through the wing on a horse called Lorac, which was Carol spelt backwards. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Carol was there and finished up in hospital. And some point to points we were training, they went on one races, ridden by Ron Trelogan. Oh, really? He, he oh. just he caught the loose horse at Taunton and he, he took up riding them and they won. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Um, I thought, it's, re it's not really for me. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try and train them. And then somebody said, we had a few winners in point to points. And, uh, but you trained. But I trained. Yeah. And um, I didn't even know how to train them. didn't know what I was doing. Uh, and then some people said, um, you've had some winners, can you train? I said, no, I can't train because I've got to have a license to train. So we managed to get a license. I'm sure it was just the jockey club being sympathetic to us, <laughs> um, you know, because I got injured or something. And we managed to win a few sellers. And, and was that from Pond House? From Pond House. So, so you, when, but Pond House wasn't ready made, was it? No, Pond House wasn't there. All, all the stables were pigsties, all fallen down. Okay. And we'd built some stables. We'd built a, a, a line of 16 stables, and it housed greyhounds to begin with. Okay. His dad used to run the local dog track, and he set it up that's right around the cricket ground in Taunton. And he set it up, and he wanted some runners so you know, we just have six greyhounds in every in every stable honestly yeah, right, right. and then we used to we used to train those at home was he a good greyhound trainer yes well yes yeah. yes yes he used to drive the hare and do everything did he? he really did, did he? he really did <laughs> <laughs> he really did some, it taught me a lot we used to have the one-armed bands is it bandits in the uh okay. in the clubs down there and i used to play them with sixpence whatever it was he said don't do that don't do that it's a waste of money i said i win i win i said i'll tell you what i do I'll give you those two machines, and you can have the takings from it. And of course, I learned that <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you yeah. can't win playing the machines. No. So it, it taught me lessons. Um, so I started training, and um, I used to win some sellers by the horses. For, we, we went to well, one of the horses we trained point to points. Went to Ascot Sales, bought it for three hundred quid. Didn't know why it's cheap. I've got a real bargain. Took it home. It had a leg. You I didn't. didn't know. I didn't know what a leg was. No, no. <laughs> so I've got a. A, a car with with one puncher, so then I started reading all the books. I read all these all these books. I'm this is where that, I learned. That, that looks fairly well used. That book. I think modern, it's a... modern horse management by R. S. Timms. No, so no. I started reading all this, and, and we got this horse fired, gave it a year off, and got it to win. Um, so we bought all the horses were cheap, and so if they cheap, we ran them in the sellers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we kept winning with the sellers, and and, and we took blood tests. That book told me you ought to take a blood test. So I took a blood test on one. Is this at a very early stage, all of this? Yes, the very early stage, before I had... We took a blood test, so we took a blood test, and the vet came, took the blood test. Like two weeks later, we get the result. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. That's how long it took. Yeah, so yeah. he took the blood test. And he said, the, the horse won't win. And I thought, you don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, the, the haemoglobin's down, this is down. It's, it's, I said, what happens if I run it? He said, it'll run to about 60% of his capacity, but it, it's, it's not fit, it's not... don't know what you're talking about. That's what I thought under my breath. So I ran it, didn't back it or anything like that, ran it. Lo and behold, he's right. <laughs> so, so that taught me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would never run a horse without taking a blood test. So, so, when, so when you were it was a you know, converted pig, star, you know, pig yes. farm, so you, you had to put the gallop in, for instance. I mean, why, we why didn't did have you, a gallop. We didn't, didn't have a gallop. So why did you choose? I mean, that's probably one of the most famous gallops I can remember when I was riding. Oh, this Martin Pike keeps having winners. He trains up a really steep gallop on the side of a hill. But it's actually not that steep, is it? It's not that steep. 
Um, we didn't have that gallant to begin with. We just um, used to use the grass. When Baron Blakeney won, we were just using grass, and it was all mangled up. We didn't have a gallop? No gallop. We, we used to go around the sand ring. It was so wet, we used to canter around the sand ring, six of us in there, just canter round and round a small sand ring. But I had a swimming pool. I always wanted a swimming pool. So I went to Newmarket and saw the swimming pool. I thought, that's the answer. I need a swimming pool. So Baron Blakeney used to swim 200 laps of the pool. 200 what? laps. And again, <laughs> I, I didn't realise because all horses... Swim differently, gallop differently, move differently. Everything moves differently. Lucky he didn't drown him. He, he wouldn't drown. He wouldn't. He'd just go in the pool and he'd float round. So he really wasn't using any energy, if you know what I mean. So he, he was just a natural. He'd just go round and float round. So he's only doing the half of the work. The interesting thing is, you know, you, you've sort of broken all the moulds of what we imagine a trainer is. You know, in the days gone by, it was sort of military men all dressed in tweed. You, you'd come in there, didn't know the front end from the back end. True, very and, true. And, and, started, and, and, and started completely afresh. I mean, I, I, it just, it, to me, I, I've always been around horses. It just seems unbelievable that you could do that. Um, I'd never worked for a, a trainer, which I, I really miss. I'm sure if I'd worked for a trainer, I'd have learned an awful lot. That's why I love going around the yards now and seeing what they do. And being very nosy. I've always been very nosy. <laughs> um, but I, I didn't know a thing. So... I used to run two in a cellar, a pacemaker in a cellar. Did you? So, so the pace was right. I never thought about making my own pace. And I thought, that's wrong. Dad said, why, why can't you make all? Oh, you couldn't do that. They've got to be fit and they've got to jump. So obviously you start off from scratch. Number one, you get them to jump. Um, I remember that the first horse we bought, I jump it over one hurdle. That's it, perfect. Don't want it to hurt itself. But it's got to have practice. It's got mm. to risk. The only way it gets better is by practicing all the time. So eventually we built a loose school. And, and um, so then you've got to get the pace of the race right. Um, mm. uh, the, 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 the dynamics of you knowing about, I mean, how did you ever know about horses? You, you mentioned you didn't know a horse had a leg. You know, all the different problems that horses get, breathing problems, all these different things. You know, how did you learn all that? Just by trial and error. Okay. I made loads of mistakes. I've trained more losers than anybody. <laughs> well, but luckily a few winners as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, t so tell us, tell us how this interval training came about. Um, I remember reading a book about Emil Zatopek. Okay. How he, how he used to train. And I thought that seems a good idea. We used to canter round and round in a circle for half an hour. And, you, well, I couldn't hold one side of it. You know, it'd, be, it'd get slower and slower and slower. And, and that didn't work. We, we, we tried everything. So then we, um, I said, we want to... A straight gallop. So Dad said, knock out the hedges. So we knocked out some hedges and put grass turf down mm. and just used the grass. And so we knocked out more hedges. I said, it's, Dad wanted me to go around the, around the sides all wiggly. I said, no, it's got to be straight. I want a straight gallop so the horse doesn't change legs. So he, he, he's yeah, all, yeah. always on the right leg and everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. To make it easy for the horse. Um, so we did this and then we started going up and down. Um, just cantering up, um, and it seemed to work. And they liked the little interval at the top, and it seemed to get them fit without being hard on them. So they loved doing it. I, was, I, I always imagine, and, and you hear so many different rumours, there's some successful, you always hear rumours. I was, I was led to believe you were really hard on the horses, you know, really, you know, it was, you know, really get them so fit. The, the horses love it. They, they, if, if they didn't like it, they wouldn't do it. No. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Um, that they loved going up and down. They had loved having a break at the top. When we get some horses from Newmarket, they'd be like tearaways. They'd go up a million miles an hour and you'd have a job stopping them, you know what I mean? Um, we used to jump the hedge at the top loads of times. <laughs> I'm, I'm the record breaker. I used to jump it all the time. <laughs> well, you couldn't hold them. <laughs> couldn't hold them. They, they'd go straight over the hedge and I jumped it both ways as well. <laughs> the other way. um, so, but the horses get relaxed and they get used to it. Uh, the staff weren't allowed to carry whips. They oh, just go up and twos or threes, and, and they're not, they're not race against each other. So you wouldn't really know if a, a was better than B, but you could see how they were working. It, it was really, uh, and they loved it. At the time, I was, when your book came, first came out, I was working at Captain Tim Forces, and he, he said to me, <laughs> do you know, I've just read Martin Pike's book, 30 years I've been training, I've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> it's, 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 the way you did things were just so, so innovative, wasn't it? Captain Tim Forster came down and um, uh, 
sat in our conservatory and uh, um, we had a long chat. He's a, a lovely gentleman. Yeah, super he, gentleman. He was, he was but really, really good. But so different, so different to the way the way that you do things. You know, we used to do long, steady we canter for miles. You know, round and round. Exactly the said. You know, that's why we had slow horses, I suppose. When, I, when we started, I used to go out and trot up towards the beacon, trot up the hill, trot up a very steep hill. We'd be out for two, three hours at a time. We, we, with my head lad, Dennis, who was uh, still here now, yeah. but he, uh, we used to stop and buy ice cream and <laughs> from the local shop, go up and down. Lovely walks around the roads. We knew everything, knew every, everybody. Never trained a winner. Never mm. trained a winner. So how, how long do you think is the optimum time for a horse to be out then? To be out, uh, to, to be out, it takes three months for me to get a horse fit, I believe. From, from, so when from it comes scratch, from grass, from grass okay. it takes three months to get it fit to win. Do you do, do, you do, do, you do road work with it? We, we do some road work. A lot is in, in our indoor school now. Um, okay. So let's say four weeks of that. Yeah. Um, and then six weeks of cantering. Okay. Um, that, that would get the horse fit. Do you, and, All and, horses are different. Yeah. Some... Light ones need less work. Some fillies need less work. Some stuffy ones need more work. And do you train the... Would you have trained, say, Atoll Atoll, who won at Royal Ascot for your two-year-old? <laughs> would, 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 you know, would you train, you, you, train you, horses you, differently? You train... The, the fitness is you just got to get a horse fit. So the two-year-old doesn't need as much work as a ten-year-old who's getting very lazy and needs more work, perhaps. Um, the feeding is important as well. But at all, at all, it was a funny horse. We bought him in the bar at Doncaster Cells. <laughs> it's amazing. So um, I've met loads of people that were under bidder for him, but he never went through the cells. And we bought him. Um, and uh, that was the first two-year-old I had. And uh, I didn't know what to do. So we tried him at the gallops, and he was going to OK. So I thought, I'd better buy a cellar to see if he's any good. So we bought a cellar and worked him with the cellar. Ooh. This and he left the cellar. <laughs> Standing, so we thought this is okay. And we worked him with three year olds and older horses, and we thought this is okay. Paul Leach used to ride him, Did and we he? thought this is okay, so this is good. So we took him to Bath, Bath races, and Paul Edry rode him. There were some um, good horses in the race, and he said Michael Stout's got one, cost 80,000. So and so that one's from Newmarket, it's working really well. And, and in the end, honestly. He didn't want to listen to me because I didn't know what I was talking about. You know, I didn't, and he was quite right, I suppose. But um, then Mrs. Mrs. Pipe went to the race. Honestly, I promise you, she's never done it before. She just caught hold of him like this. Just caught hold of him. said, this will win. <laughs> because we had to get him to understand that this was going to win. This was uh, our derby. This was our, our important race. This was going to win. doesn't matter about all the others. We, we thought this would win. So he came back in. You were right, ma'am. You were right, ma'am. We didn't know it was that good, and then it went on to win at Royal Ascot. <laughs> we won the Windsor Castle. You were, you were just talking about feed. Did you have your own feed? Did you make your own feed up? Um, we had, grew our own oats, grew our own hay, um, and then we eventually we started on some racehorse nuts, some cubes, which were specially made for us. It, what, so so why, why did you, you know, what didn't you like about the other feed, or why, what, what was so special about them? Tried to improve, I'm sure. Diet's so important for all sportsmen, um, and especially it's important for training racehorses. I'm sure it, the diet can be improved now, mm. and the quantity they eat. We're lucky with the racehorse because he's, he's shut in a stable, so he's not like me or you, goes yeah. out and has a drink and uh, yeah. has a hangover the next day. So we control exactly what he eats, exactly what he drinks, and exactly what exercise he has. So he's an athlete, which is, is enclosed, and we, we've got to keep him happy. I always say, if you open our stable doors, the horse will not run out. If you get a new horse in, it's just come, it'll take two or three weeks for him to settle into his home. But if you open the stable doors, nine out of ten will not run out of the stable. They'll stay there because they know that's their home, that's where they live. So, and so what, were, you, were you upping the protein then? We, what? we feed the high protein now. I don't know if that's good, but we feed some high protein. And it's been specially made for us. Okay. Uh, it's still, it's still the, the nutritionist would come every year and say, why don't we increase this? Why don't we increase that? Uh, and try and get the balance right. So, so it is updated every year. Do you, do you think that, I, I think it's obviously trains, you go to every yard, they all seem to feed different things or different ways and what have you. Do you think that the feeding's done on what work you do and how you train that horse? Obviously, you've got to have the balance. Mm. If you eat too much and no exercise, you put on weight. If you don't eat enough, 
and too much exercise, you lose weight. So the weight is important of the horse. They all laughed at me when I had scales. All the local trainers, don't need scales. I can tell how heavy it is. I know how much it loses. And my head lad, Dennis, said, we don't need scales. I can tell. But you can't tell. It, it's, you've got to have facts. That's what I was taught. That's what my father taught me. You always have facts. You can't get away from facts. Because they weigh greyhounds, don't they, as well? They, so, they weigh greyhounds, yeah, yeah. obviously. It's, it's like the price of the horse. The price of the horse is so important. Um, if it's 100 to 1, it's got no chance, basically. Mm -hmm. If it's 6 or 4 on, you want to ride that one rather than the 100 to 1. When, when the jockeys used to come in the, in the uh, ring, I used to get somebody used to run and tell me all the prices. And so and so and so and so. This one's been back from 20 to 1 to 10s. So if that one goes off in front, Skew, mind you, keep an eye on it. I don't think it can win, but there's a lot of money about for it. So I've often seen that the guy, Ray, is it, or comes in with, yes, a, with, all the, in, with yes. the prices. Yeah. And, and he used to give me all the prices and tell me the ones they backed, because it's so important. Money talks. That's incredible, isn't it? It's, it's so important. We always did that from the word go, because of my bookmaking uh, interests. And, and your horses were always, you, you've always said, you, you don't see fat athletes. That's right. And your horses were always very, very light. You know, you say, oh, there's a pipe, whip it. I, I went to Doncaster once. Um, I, I don't think I had a run. I just went to Doncaster. And I always thought I was a good paddock judge. That's, again, knowing nothing. But I went through all the horses, all the horses in the paddock. That horse can't win. It's a skeleton but it was very light. That horse can't win. No way. It was Michael Dickinson's, and it won half the track. Blimey. And I thought, he's right, and I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah. They, they've got to be fit. But against that, I remember Fred Winter bringing a horse down to Newton Abbott, and I, I call it, it was in foal. It, yeah, it yeah. was big. It was big. It won half the track. But, of course, it had so much ability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you think? How do you think? Just it's it's really interesting, actually. How do you think the the Fort Woolwinds and the Fred Winters of their day would would fare now? I'm sure they were all very, very good trainers. Um, it's so different, isn't it? The, the old trainers were very, very good. I'm sure if they still had the, the caliber of horses that we had, that they'd still win races with them. Yeah. But they had no all weather gallops in those days. That's that's been a great help. Um, but they they're good good grass gallops that helps. But uh, you, they're all trained completely differently now. But they were very good trainers, and they would be the good in, in, in it with any horse. So we've discussed feed, exercise, but probably the most famous thing here is your laboratory. Now, you're the one that first started all the blood testing and, and really looking inside the animal rather than just from the outside. It's so important to get facts again. Um, I went to a lecture once in Newmarket by Barry Allen. Oh, yeah. And all the trainers were there. And I wasn't a trainer at the time. I was just listening and fascinated by everything. And um, he says, I was about, about the only person that went up to speak to him afterwards. I said, excuse me, Mr. Allen. He says, when, when I grow up, when I'm a trainer, I want a laboratory. Can you set one up for me? Yes, I'll set one up for you. And he told me all the... Uh, he said, I'll set one up for you. And um, I don't know, within six months anyway. I found out, I said, I want a laboratory. He said, when? I said, tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So we went out and bought all the, all the stuff, all the machines, and came down and set up our laboratory, as it is. It's improved and improved now since with different machines doing more tests. Um, but it's facts. It is a fact. You know, you, if you go to the doctors, what should you do? Take your temperature, take a blood test, and you can see what's wrong with you. It's so simple. What were you, so you're trying to find out how many red blood cells they've got and, and so, so they get more oxygen in the how system? How fit they are. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And to begin with, we just had a very small haemoglobin machine. And I said to Dennis, I said, just take some bloods. No, we don't know. I know how fit they are. I, know. I said, just do this, Dennis. Just go through it for me. Take a blood test. And when the haemoglobin, when it's 14.4, it wins. So, so, so he did it reluctantly. He went through and through. I got one. Got one. Lo and behold, it won 14.4. No. I mean, that's, it's, not, that, that it's not as easy it. as that. It's not as easy as that. And they kept winning. So that, that tells you what the haemoglobin should be. And we, we've now got 4,000 blood tests taken the day before the races uh, of all the winners. So we know exactly what the highs, the lows, what they are, 
what they can win at, what they can't win at. That's the most important thing. What you've never had a winner at. And David only said to me a couple of months ago, Dad, I've got this, this horse. What, what do I do with it? I said, I don't know, David. We'll, we'll just check. So we just check and go through. I said, well, I've never had a winner with that. What, that, it's that so reading. low? I've what? never had a winner with that reading. So no. we don't run it and wait till it gets within the parameters. Because they, they did that with cycling. And you, you get to hemoglobin, they'd say, you're, you're ex you cannot win the Tour de France if right. you're below a certain number. That's right. And then it's, it's simple. It's simple. So horses don't win uh, unless they're all ill. They don't win. If there's, if there's 10 runners that are ill, one of them's got to win. But um, if there's 10, 10 with a bad blood test, one of them's got to win. That's what Barry Allen always says. But um, they, they've got to have the correct hemoglobin. Do you think you know, the reason... <laughs> You were so far ahead of the game. It's I don't know. Well, was I ahead of the game? Well, you <laughs> it's, it's not a game, for, for no. first of all. No, no, it's not a game. But it's... I mean, <laughs> it's, was, a, you were it's so, a profession. You, you, you were so far clear. And it, 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 you're making it sound so... I wonder why other people weren't doing it. it. It is so simple that people perhaps didn't used to get them fit. Perhaps, perhaps people didn't want to win. I wanted to win every race. I wanted to win every race there was uh, with, with the horses. So you get them as fit as you can. Um, I think one of Dr. Newland's um, assistants came down and he said, he went through my horses and he said, all the horses you had, they were all very moderate horses, all very moderate horses, but they never fell. They never fell. They just jumped and won. He says, it's amazing when you go through them all. Um, schooling is so important. Mm. Schooling is so important. If they can't jump, they can't win. Is that, why, is that why your horses always, I mean, to start off with, latterly you started holding on to a few, but mostly they made the running, didn't they? So what do you do if, if your horse is fit, if he's an athlete? Um, my horses never used to stop in front. I don't know where that comes from, stop in front. Um, the, the, that's what the jockey's paid for, to keep him going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they go off. One or two you get that don't like it, one or two. But um, they go off in front, jump. And if you have an advantage, why, why lose the advantage? Why make a good jump? And you see loads of people, even now, pulling them back. Why do you lose the advantage you've gained? It doesn't I, make sense. I, I mean, that obviously, a great judge that you were, you only gave me one ride. One ride you gave me. I, I can remember that. Yeah, banger. I, I was desperately looking for a jockey. <laughs> still, and you still I were. I was desperately after I was looking smoked. for a jockey. <laughs> And they, they said, no, nobody's available. There's about 15 meetings, I think, lots of meetings on the bank holiday. Um, I, I need a jockey. He said, Luca. I said, no, no, no. no. Oh, can I say that? Can I say that? Yeah. I said, no, no. So anyway, so the horse was called Mugoni Beach. <laughs> and Luke Harvey rode him. And he was absolutely brilliant. I don't know, I don't know if you got run away with no, him. No, no, I'll tell you what. He won. I'll tell you what your orders were to me. And I thought, what's this? He's <laughs> barking. Anyway, so you said, get, jump him out in front and go as fast as you can. And I thought, what the... Anyway, so I, I jumped off. I went like the clappers. And, and I remember going with the circuit, circuit to, to go, looking back, and literally I was a, a distance clear. And it, he got tired, but he kept going. I haven't given you a bollocking for that. No, no, you For winning too far. For winning too far. <laughs> well, you never gave me another ride. I mean, what more can I do? He won, and then you, you phoned me up the next day and said, thank you very much for the winner. Yes, I'd like to ride again. I said, I said Luke, why, Luke, why don't we leave it at that? Leave it unbeaten, 100%. Yeah, you were brilliant. You were absolutely brilliant. You were absolutely brilliant. No, the first big, your first big win, of course, was Baron Brakeney. I watched that this morning, actually. Beat Broadsword, didn't he? That's right, Broadsword. Um, Broadsword was a certainty in the race, um, trained by David Nicholson, uh, a brilliant trainer, and um, we were on 66 to 1, Baron Blakeney. He just won the previous week at Worcester, and he had, had to win to, to get in the triumph because he wouldn't have been qualified otherwise. And I told everybody, um, if he'd been trained by a proper trainer, been trained by Fred Winter or somebody, he'd be about 14 to 1 shot, but because it was Muggins, he, he was 66 to 1. In fact, Chester backed him at 50 to 1 anti post. So uh, he went off and the jockey, Paul Leach, rode him. He lost the whip at the last hurdle. I saw that. He was hitting, him. He was it, hitting him with, um, with his hand, wasn't he? That's it? right, hitting down there. And then it was a photo finish. I just stood um, uh, away from the, the, finish, the finishing line. I remember shouting out, Who, what's one, what's one? <laughs> and uh, Joe Kelly, who was a, 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 big, a big noise on the race course, and he said, of course you've so-and-so won. <laughs> and uh, we were delighted, you know. And then Peter Scudor, when he started riding for me, he used to come in our hallway, and every day 
he passed the picture of a broadsword being beaten by Baron Blakeney. And it, there was about six pictures, I think, four pictures in line. And uh, he, he said that made him fed up every day. <laughs> but so you mentioned Chester. Think about it. You're, you're the son of a, a, a greyhound trainer who yes. didn't know the front end from the back end. And then you decide to get a table tennis player as your assistant. Yes, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> how, did you, how did you meet Chester? It was through a friend of us, ours, Malcolm Zadell, uh, who used, used to live in Brixham. And he said he knew a table tennis player, uh, Chester. So um, I used to like table tennis and used to think I was good and a friend was very good. So he invited him up and we played my friend at table tennis um, and introduced him to my friend uh, George. Said, and he played table tennis. And my friend always won. He was very good at like county championship. He, he was good at table tennis. And Chester beat him 21-3. It's a good, good shot, George. Another game, then he, that is 21-2. And then another, another game... 21 love <laughs> and uh, then I said Richard I'd like to introduce you to Chester Barnes and he said pipe you so, so but they loved it he loved it being beaten then being beaten by him but he, he's a real character as well Chester isn't he Chester um he, he loved punting and we used mm. to tip him a few winners so it's quite an unlikely partnership isn't it you know but so, you've been brilliant friends brilliant friends he used to drive me around all the race courses in those days we had to drive everywhere we used to drive three hours up to Haydock and three hours back go off to all the meetings. We didn't know the results. Um, I used to have to phone in the office to get the results of other meetings. It was uh, unbelievable. Now, you mentioned Haydock. Wasn't that the first place you had a massive punt on horse called Carrie Ann, wasn't it? Haddock. Haddock. Yeah, Haddock. Yeah. Haddock. Yeah. <laughs> I used to love Haydock. Um, yes. Tell uh, us the story about that. A horse called Carrie Ann, who was bred out of Clever Caroline, who used to be trained by Billy Williams. Yeah. And uh, my, my father had that one. And we bred this horse. She was no good. She yeah. was a, side, a seller, moderate. But whenever we said win, she won. Yeah, yeah. So we, we went to, um, had it lined up and got it fit. It had been off for a year. Got it fit for this seller at Haydock. And I remember my father gave me a real rollicking the night before. Why are you going to Haydock? It's 220 miles. Why not go to Taunton? It's cheaper. Save a Saves few on quid. The, <laughs> save on the transport. I said, this is the right race, Dad. We had a big argument the night before. And he was just testing me, really. So, you know, I said, Look, well, it'll win this race. It'll win. 33 to 1 it was. And he told Chester uh, not to back it on the toes. We went up and uh, drove in Land Rover and trailer going up. And uh, saw Lenny Lungo up there. said, this will win. But if you're going to back it, give me. And Lenny opened his wallet, which is very unusual. <laughs> oh, opened his wallet. Never heard of that before. <laughs> and he had a, a, a tenor on it. and he, So it won. And Rod Newman rode it. And... Uh, we, we backed him with every bookmaker on the race course. Honestly, Chester went in the first... He was, he was dressed up in a big sheepskin coat. Um, I've got a picture here somewhere with, with him. And um, <laughs> his, his first bet was 2,000 to 60 with Walters and Williams. And, said, and there was about 33 bookmakers there. There was loads That's of bookmakers there. And uh, he, he said he hasn't altered it. He just, he just, <laughs> I said, well, go in again. Go in again. <laughs> and we had 60 quid with every bookmaker on the race course. Honestly, Blimey. and it still returned, and uh, it won. And didn't you forget to, forget to pick your money up? We, there was loads of money we left behind, and we had to go back and collect some, yes. And then we get home, and we found out eventually that um, Dad had backed it with every bookmaker in England. And I mean every credit bookmaker in England, and round all the betting shops and everything. And he'd had £60, £80 to win on the tote. Right. On the tote, and it paid... Um, I don't know, about 140 to 1 on the tote. And they stopped taking tote bets then afterwards. But we, we didn't rig the tote or anything. It was just colossal. And I've still got some receipts now. He said, well, you really had it off here, David. He backed <laughs> it. All the local betting shops were wiped out. Uh, they, honestly, they, they couldn't pay out. And uh, he won a fortune. I realised that's why he put me through it. <laughs> it, ma it, makes, it makes me laugh, really, because... In this sort of day and age, people are, you know, people also turn their nose up. You know, if you're having a bet as a, as a trainer, or, but you know, people always saw the trainer say, "Oh no, 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 I do, not my money, not my money." And, yet, <laughs> and you're, again, you're the, you're the complete but opposite. We, we, I always used to like to prophesy what would happen to the horse. Um, mm. I think it'll win today. It's a certainty. You know, you can't get beat. And I'd open my mouth, which is silly, but uh, you always have an opinion. You always have today's opinion. Mm. Whatever it is, you know what the ground is, you know everything, you know the horse is fit, you know what the opposition is, and you weigh it up um, and work it out. You know, it jumps. And I'd always have an opinion. I remember saying to Terry Neal one day, I said, this horse can't possibly win. 
um, I think the Noble Inside it was called, Peter Scudamore bought it. He said, I want to run it at Kempton on Boxing Day. I said, you can't possibly win, no chance at all. But, OK, I'll run it, I'll run it. It won at 33 to 1. <laughs> so I was wrong in that opinion. I can, remember well, I can remember well Chief, just off the top of my head, winning at Taunton. And I think he's about 12 or 14 to 1. So you obviously didn't think he was much cop. Um, he came, we bought a really good horse. David Johnson bought a horse from, um, Graham Bradley bought them from Germany. Um, and so we, we told AP, I said, I don't, I love the horse who ran in the champion hurdle, it was useless. And we had World Chief, I said, I don't like World Chief. It's a little thing, um, it needs gelding for a start, he's horrible, you know, so and so. Anyway, I said, he can't half jump. He said, better geld it then. So we I said, he can't half jump, David. So we, we schooled him. I said, he can't half, he's a brilliant jumper, he can't half jump. Um, I said, why don't we give it a run, we'll give it a run. I said, we'll give it, it's only half it, it can't possibly win. Give it a run at Taunton. So AP let AP off to ride one for Venetia Williams, I think, the odds-on favourite. And it's Tom Skew rode World Chief. Put him, do your best, go and enjoy yourself, see what happens, you know. And of course, oh. fell out with AP. <laughs> 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 World Chief came flying by and World Chief won. So AP weren't very happy, he wasn't very happy. But David Johnson were all delighted that, that he won. And he was only half fit. I mean, I shouldn't have run him, really. And then he went on to win the Arkle. He was a very good horse. Uh, the, other, so the, other, the other thing I find uh, interesting is that none of your owners that I'd really ever heard of before. So it, but these are sort of new people. Like, but for instance, David Johnson, that's the, the big partnership. Where, where did the, that association come about? A DJ. Um, he had a horse called Bob's. Bob's something it was. Yeah. And um, I think it probably was through Peter Scudamore. We wanted Peter Scudamore to ride it. And he sent it to us. Oh, okay. And he came down, just started off with one horse. Um, and he was really enthusiastic. Uh, we got him to win. Um, and he loved it. And he loved to punt. I said, back so and so to win. And I used to get quite a few right. Those wrong, but quite a few right. Um, and he loved it. And he just built up his string immensely. And um, again, I suppose that association is built up from, from gambling, really. From gambling, just from trust. Yeah, yeah. You know, we'd, I'd tell him what I thought. And sometimes it was right. That first, and that, he'd buy anything, he was really good. That first meeting at Cheltenham was always the one you used to clean up, you used to sort horses out for that. The Paddy every, Power, yes. Yeah, yes every yes, year you used to yes. do it. He went to um, Ireland and bought loads of horses from Tom Costello. Um, but but he, he, we, we left it to him. And we saw them all lose school and uh, jump. And uh, he said, well, I said, well, you go and sort it out, David. I don't know. I don't know which ones to buy. You, you sort it out. So he'd go and sort out the money deal, you know, um, you, you sort it all out. I said, what did you buy, what did you buy? He said, I bought all 20. <laughs> <laughs> so he bought all, I thought, oh my God, I don't know how many he had in training with us at the time. So he's just, another 20, where do I put them? I had nowhere to put them, no, nowhere at all. So I think we hired Bob Buckler's stables, I think it was, or something to put them in, so and so. And um, because of the long story short, then I said, one of us, makes a noise. They were all not vetted, everything as they stood, brilliant it was. But Tom was a lovely guy, um, so brilliant horses. So um, this horse, one of these horses made a noise. Oh. And I said, oh, it doesn't matter. He said, um, tell, tell him, we don't want it. It makes a noise. It's no good. We don't want it. So he, f he, he phoned up and told him he was embarrassed to tell him, really. He, and Tom said, keep it. It's all right, keep it. I'll send you another one. So the, the one that made the noise was no good. And, useless. So he sends us another one. So I thought, we've got a freebie, you know, so that's something. You know. <laughs> um, so the poor horse came in the yard, I thought, I don't like you. It's free. <laughs> it can't be any good, can it? It <laughs> cannot be any good. Do you know the name of the horse? No. Comply or die. You're joking. <laughs> Grand <laughs> National winner. <laughs> so I wouldn't have had a Grand National winner without that. <laughs> Amazing. I know it sounds like a probably ridiculous question, but you know, when you look at it, can you, some people have got a better eye than others. You, there's no sort of set standard horse. I don't say, well, that's a pipe horse, or, you know, you, you, big ones, small ones. Uh, I look to buy a winner. Mm. That's what I always used to look to buy. In its class, obviously a seller costs selling money. Um, a go-cup horse, I've never trained a go-cup winner, so I wouldn't know. Um, it costs a lot more, more money, basically. Winning becomes a, becomes a habit, and when you don't win after a while, it's a happy that's, that's not very nice, isn't it? So, so you know, once you started winning championships, it must have been, you know, it must have been absolutely superb, but in some ways, wearing as well. Not really, you just want more of it. 
Mm. It's, it's like AP. It's, it's so people are like, trying to knock you off your perch, aren't they? Yes, we had the Cook Report. But yeah, what was that? I mean, which was not very nice at all. Um, very upsetting because we had so many winners and somebody got it up um, because they, they thought it was wastage. Where are all the horses going? What's happening? And why is it, why are they, they getting winners? They thought I had the, uh, the laboratory and I was filling them with other horses' blood or God knows what and, and things like that. But it was all far-fetched. Um, it really was horrible. They came down and spied on us. They had long-distance cameras. Um, it was horrendous. But the, the press were very good. We used to tell the, the uh, racing posts or Sporting Life, whatever it was, what was going on. And they'd print it on the page. We said, we've got nothing to hide. There's nothing to hide. We're doing nothing wrong. Um, in, in actual fact, they, they came down and some friends of ours sat behind them on the train coming down. And we picked them up from Tiverton Parkway and they were listening. We're going to get Martin Pike. We're going to get this. And th mm -hmm. that's what they were talking. And a friend, Carol's friend, was sat behind, heard everything and made notes and told us so we knew what they were going to do and we told them and we had the phone call and they said they, they, these people are down to get you and is that so is it, do you think it's jealousy within within racing that, that it was jealousy within racing um lots of uh trainers were very good rang me up and it was a horrible program it really was a horrible program um cook he didn't know what he was talking about no. he'd been fed loads of bad information he, he knew nothing um, first of all, I said, I'm not going to do it live. Uh, I'm not going to do it recording, I'll do it live. And they wouldn't do that, so I, I sat in the room and um, talking to everybody, nothing, nothing at all. It really was horrendous. Lots of trainers were very supportive and very good. There were a few, there were a few that didn't like it. And I remember telling everybody, um, it, it was a horrible evening, absolutely horrible. We had the vet there, everybody there, and... I really wanted to commit suicide, really hated it. And um, I, I told the office, anybody that phones up and says, it's OK, all the people that phone up that are again, again me, that are against me, I want to speak to them and talk. And I had lots of interesting chats to people. And because, uh, again, I went racing, I think, a day, two days afterwards. I didn't want to go racing. I hated everybody in the world. That's why I was very aloof with press and things like that. Really, I was really upset. And they went to uh, extra races and didn't want to show my face, just mm. walked in, walked in. And a steward comes up to me. A steward comes up to me, Mr. Pipe. I thought, what's this going to be? Mr. Pipe, I'd like to send you a horse. Really? <laughs> and it, it brought me back to life, yeah, I promise yeah. you. It brought me back to life. And that's uh, Mr. Brown, it was. Fantastic guy. And he sent me a horse, and we had loads of winners, and it really restored faith in me. I really loved it. Yeah, I remember World Chief winning first time at Taunton. I think Roddy Green rode him, and he wasn't fancy. He, he... Sorry, that's sorry. right. Fast. Yeah, okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was Tom Skew. Was it? I think it's Roddy Green. All right. Do you want a pound? Do you want a pound on it? A pound? <laughs> right, let's go. Okay, okay. Was it? Can we check? Can we no, check? No, it? no. I'll, I'll check. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Do you want me to clap again? A pound. <coughs> well, 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 Chief, yeah. Yeah. If, if it's Tom Skew, will you just go like that to me? Yeah. Or go like that to, okay. to, to, to us. All right. Because uh, yeah. you want to get it right. Okay. Brilliant. That's really good, thank you. Yeah. Well, um... And you owe him a pound as well. Ah! <laughs> that's it, that's it. I thought it was Buddy Roddy Green. Ah! <laughs> I've got it recorded. I've got it. Come on. Pay up, pay up or shut up. Pay up or shut up. Come on. You, you've got to get your facts right. Yeah. Yeah, you to put... Pay up, come on. I'll, I'll just... give, give me a tenner. I'll yeah. give you a change. No, I'll give you. <laughs> well, welcome back. I'm having to give Martin Pipe a pound. We had a bet on who rode well chief in his first run. And it was Tom Scooter. <laughs> I, thought it, I thought it was Ronnie so Green. I thought it was Ronnie Green. But I'm going to frame that. <laughs> <laughs> you want to? Hey, but j jockeys, are, obviously, you can't do anything without a good jockey, and you've had some of the best. What was your relationship like with AP, for instance? I thought it was good. <laughs> A few, occasions, a few occasions it wasn't. <laughs> well, he could get moody mind, didn't he? I don't know. Um, yes, he was young and very good. Um, he wanted to win. He had the same will 
as I did, that want to win. Um, he's a very good jockey. A few ups and downs we had. I remember when, Cypher, when Barry won on Cypher Malta, Barry Geraghty, I think if he could have got you then, he'd have, he'd have pommeled you into the ground. Probably. <laughs> I wouldn't be here. So no. luckily, luckily he never got me. <laughs> and when he rode, um, I think it was, um, there was Copeland and another oh, one. Oh, Roddick. Rod Roddick. Yeah, yeah, Roddick. yeah. Yes, I ran the two in the same race. And um, he chose the wrong one, can you believe? Didn't he waste? <laughs> you probably told him to ride it, did you? <laughs> no. Is that the one when he wasted down to ridiculous low weight? Did he Could do be. 10 stone no, or no, something? No, I don't think so, not. Oh, right, OK. <laughs> Copeland was, I th I'm not sure. And, um, you know, he was um, very upset. He said, well, you have to run it. But you had to run it because both owners wanted to run. Mm. And, um, you know, if I didn't run it, you would save it for another race. But he was very, he was furious. And I think that was his mate that lodged with him that mm. rode it. Oh, um, who was it? D David, some of it was it? Yeah, David Casey it was. David Casey, yes, that's right. He rode Copeland and he won, so uh, AP wasn't very happy that day. And a few other days he wasn't very happy. You, but you had, a, you had a good relationship with him, didn't you? I think so. No, yes. no, 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 he yes, did. I mean, he fun. loved you. He, I mean, he absolutely no, loved you. You know, he just, he, he just thought he, you... He didn't say that to my face. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had some great times. He'd love it. I, I'd go in the, in the paddock and I'd say, um, this will win. This will win. And it, it's cross his arms. What do I do? What do I do? So we always gave instructions. We always gave instructions to jockeys. I, I, I can't understand. I thought it's a rule of racing you've got to give instructions. And the trainer say I left, left it to him. But you always have instructions. Winning instructions if they go far. What decides a, the, a race is the going. You know the going straight away. The pace of the race is so important and the horse's fitness and the jumping or all. But the, those are uh, the three factors. The most important one, you know the going when, when you go, so it's no good using it as an excuse, is the pace of the race. Mm -hmm. So you're the driver, you've got to dictate the pace of the race. It's no good coming in and saying, they went too slow. That's not an excuse. I, I don't count that as an excuse. Jockeys really upset me when they come back. They, they ride a race, and they finish second, beat the length. Um, and I said, uh, what would you do if you rode it again? Oh, I'd do exactly the same thing. I said, well, you wouldn't win then, would you? Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I want them to say, like, if I'd taken that bend a, a bit more on the inside or something, or got a better jump at the second last, or done something, or, you know, you've got to make up a length. It's no good accepting the result. What could you do to improve it? And that was AP. He always wanted to improve where he finished. So if you were to judge Peter Scudamore and, and AP McCoy, which was your, your favourite rider? They both were. Skew was very good, very good front running, um, and got the pace of the race right. That's the most important thing, to get the fractions right, isn't it? Mm. It's no good. Uh, if you go too slow, you can get horses beaten by going too slow, get horses beaten by going too fast. We used to tell them to go out and make it, but not if anybody goes 100 miles an hour. They go too fast. Um, so the pace of the race is so important. Skew was a very good front running jockey. Um, we had a horse, Celsius, had to be held up until the line. Remember. There was another one, jumped very well, bred by Her Majesty the Queen. Um, in actual fact, uh, he had to produce it late, always had to produce it late. And in the end, I had to tell Skew, because you always get there too early, I said, yeah. produce it after the line. <laughs> I want you to produce it after the winning post. So that he gave him bags of confidence. He'd always go there cruising and stop. Um, he was a certainty when we were running the first time out and he went wrong, we got all the instructions wrong. And it was an Irish priest that taught us how to ride it one day at market raising, honestly, he's just a lad, and it was good. And he wore blinkers 88 consecutive times. I never took them off. If I'd known what I was doing, I'd probably take them off. And he won 20 races, very moderate races. Mm -hmm. But he was very good, but he produced him late, had to be produced late. It's, um, it's, very, difficult. it's very difficult for you to, to realise why you were, you were so good. I mean... You know, obviously, we, you know, we've, we've heard lots of things. Why was AP such... Why was he the best jump jockey we've ever seen? What, what was it, something behind, in his makeup? What, what made him so good? He was a very good judge of pace. Um, he loved what he was doing. He studied it 24 hours a day, mm. studied the opposition, knew all about it. He'd come back and say we were lucky to win because the other horse made a noise or whatever. Um, he, he judged the pace right. Uh, he'd get the horses balanced and jumping well, and he was fearless. Mm. 
is absolutely fearless and stupid. Yeah. I don't mean that in the bad. He was absolutely yeah. fearless, a brilliant jockey, and it's just this determination to win. Sometimes I'd say, I got to so you can't win this race. Just to try and wind you up, you can't win this. And he'd come back, you know, whoa, whoa, why? And he come back, I showed you, I told you. <laughs> you know, the similarity between you two is, and I, and I read it, so it's an old phrase, but most people want to win. You two, both of you, needed to win. And it, it, it's something in your makeup. That's it, you want to win. You want to, to do it right for the owners, do it right for the horse, uh, to get the horse in front, first past the post. That's the important thing. And you've got to do it all within the rules, and you've got to use every ounce that counts. Uh, if you carry a pound overweight, uh, if the horse is a 20 kilos too heavy, how much is that? 45 mm. lengths. How much is that? Overweight. If the horse is too fat, you try running around with 20 kilos on your back. Mm -hmm. You don't need to have. So you just give him the leg, get it wrong, and he gets beat. It's Carville's Hill with Wonder Jump now. He's 20 lengths in front as he comes to the last. He is pricked. Uh, it was a bit awkward at it. Jumped very high, but still got away with it. And Carville's Hill is going to walk away with a Coral Wells National. It's Carville's Hill, 15, 20 lengths in front of Aquilifer. Further back, party politics, Bonanza boy. But Carville's Hill, he shouldered 11 stone, 12 pounds to victory in the 1991 Coral Wells National. Carville's Hill came to me from the brilliant train, trainer, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Tom Draper in Ireland. Yeah. Um, I was worried about taking the, the Irish star. So he sent it off to Langford University. I've got the next report. We'll never race again. Really? Can never race again. So I'm crying, why do I get the champion race horse? I mean, it won't race. The vets say it'll never race again. Why? So I showed it to Mary Bromley. Don't worry, Martin. We'll rebuild it. That's what she said. We'll rebuild the horse. I thought, don't, don't be silly, Mary. Yeah. We'll rebuild it. So we went through the breaking, getting everything, putting weights on the horse's legs, trying to build up all the, all the problems he had. It's obvious. If this arm's weak, how do you get it stronger? Just put weights on it and do it. So you have to do it with the horse's back, with, with, with his quarters, with everything. It's, it's, it's so obvious, and, and you don't do it. But she did it. And... Mary rebuilt that horse. It was brilliant. Mm. He still had his issues, but he was brilliant. Um, and he won the Welsh National, absolutely counted up. I took him back to Ireland. Uh, we flew him over, and he won the um, Irish Girl Cup. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant. And I was really worried, apprehensive going to Ireland. I thought, Pipe, they won't like Pipey coming with their horse, you know. Was just, but I had a tremendous welcome, and it was great to win all those races. And and when when you when you when you look back now at all those those championships, can you quite believe it? I mean, fifteen times champion trainer. It's amazing, really. But once you do it once, you want to do it again. Um, so you think, what can you do? And you've got to you've got to have loads of horses. That's the important thing. Numbers, uh, as I say, I've trained loads of losers. But you've got to have plenty of horses, and you've got to have the right horses, and you've got to get the best out of each animal. They're all different, whether it's a mini uh, or a Ferrari. You've got to tune the horse up. To, to run as fast as he can for as long as he can. You can't make a, a, a slow horse win a race, but you can just try and find the race for the slowest horses. Yeah, but what, what, what you did, it, it's never going to happen again, is it? Because there was such a, a niche, there was a, such a gap in the market for, for what you did and, and the type of horse that you bought that everyone's caught up now, haven't they? Do you think so? Do you? Why? Yeah, I do. I, I think well, people just seem to get the horses fitter now, don't they? Would you still think... <laughs> There are still some horses that you see in the paddock, even at the Cheltenham Festival, that possibly shouldn't be there. Mm. So you still think there's a there's the, the, there's, there's still room a niche. for manoeuvre. But horses cost much more money now, mm. so that's a difficult part. The handicapping system is different somehow. I don't understand how have horses changed. Um, why? Why is the handicaps at Cheltenham? Why are they so tight? Yeah, I know. I mean, we used to have wasted years ago. You used to have 10 stoners with the, with the 12 stoners. Now, yes, now, now they're all at on. At the end of every season, they, they used to have to adjust all the, the handicapping weights. So they are definitely doing something differently. It's definitely a different approach. Perhaps they don't drop horses fast enough. Why, why should a horse not win for three years, four years? Obviously, he hasn't been given a fair chance. Obviously. 
just to bring it back to modern, I mean, you were so dominant in your era and you said there was a certain amount of resentment. Yet, over in Ireland, Gordon, obviously Gordon Elliott was, was here at Pond House, um, and Willie Mullins are so dominant. Do you think that's good? Why not? If they've got the horses, they've got the horses to train, so they've obviously only got numbers because they're good at it, and they keep winning. If they didn't win, they wouldn't be sent more horses. Um, so so they, they're both dominant. Um, why not? What was Gordon like when he was here? Gordon was very good. Um, he rode a few winners for us. Um, he's, he's, uh, he rode a winner for Mr Johnson around Cheltenham, normal mm. meeting. Um, very enjoyable, very likeable chap. Um, I hope he picked up a few tips from here. I hope he learned something. He certainly has because he's, he's oh, doing tremendously well. I send him congratulations on Saturday for winning the Irish National. Um, I was lucky enough to win the Irish National as well years ago with Omerta. Adrian Maguire. Adrian Maguire. Adrian Maguire rode, rode it for us, that's right. Uh, after him winning at Cheltenham. I gave him the leg up at Cheltenham. And Adrian tells me, he says, uh, I gave him the leg up. <laughs> the, the, the owner had booked Adrian Maguire I'd never heard of. I, and he said, the last thing I said to him is when, when I gave him the leg up, he said, I said, can you ride? <laughs> can you ride? <laughs> he tells me that. I'm not sure, but that's what he says. Can you ride? So we gave him the leg up and he was brilliant. And that was his first Cheltenham winner. Adrian, and then he went on to win the Irish National. It was fantastic. I can't leave you without quickly going over the un unsinkable boxer story when, I mean, you, you got him. He, again, he was a virtual write-off, wasn't he? And then you, you got him, and what yes. was your, you said to AP something, didn't you? But that's right. He, he was great. He won loads of races for us, some novice hurdles, and, novice, and we had him in the uh, handicap hurdle of attempts at uh, Cheltenham, and... I said, he's a certainty. I told, I told the owner, the night, I told the owner that two days before, I said, he's a certainty. He didn't want to run him in that race. He wanted to run him in another race. I said, look, he's already won this race. Honestly, I, and I was begging on the phone for him to run it in this race. Begging. He, he wanted to run it in another race. I said, he's already won this race. Why throw it away? It's, oh, I, I promise you, I said, he's already won. And so we told, I told AP, how do I ride it? He said, I said, it doesn't matter how you ride. You can't get beat. And apparently he was coming down the hill with Graham Bradley and he told Bradley, he said, I've already won this race. I, I'm on a certainty. And they're, they're going down the hill, he told them before, they're going down the hill and he says, uh, Bradley said to him, he said, don't, don't you think it's about time you moved on this horse? He said, if you're going to win, oh, I suppose I'd better. And this, he came on the outside, came round the bend and you can see his face smiling as he's coming <laughs> round the bend. It's about the only time he's smiling, you know, three out or whatever it was. And he's smiling and, and he won. And it was... A great day. So, so how, how tough a decision was it then to finally say, right, that's it, I'm retired and handed over to Dave? I, I wasn't moving too well um, and things were getting difficult for me. Um, I, I couldn't go and see the owners, I couldn't walk. Um, you're, you're looking in good health now. You're... I've got a new knee and it's fantastic. Okay. I couldn't go to the bar because I couldn't walk back. <laughs> I couldn't go and see them in the boxes. I, I was really in agony, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. every stride. I used to ride a bike around the yard. There's no need to now. I've got a new knee and it's been fantastic. Um, perhaps I'll take up training again. Who knows? But, um, you it, joke. It, you <laughs> joke. I wouldn't be 100 to 1 chance. I've got to try and catch up AP because he's way ahead of me. Um, so, so it was difficult. I said to David, the year before it was, I said, David, I ought to give up, David. I ought to give up. Honestly, um, you know, it's, it's, I, I can't go on. He said, no, I don't want to do it, Dad. I don't want to do it. He was still doing the point-to-pointers mm. and he did very well, mm, very training good. all the point-to-pointers. Um, we had a terrific season where we run all the championships, point to points, conditional jockeys, everything. Anyway, so uh, the following season he said, Dad, I'm ready now, I think I'll take over. This was on, on the day before the end of the season. So we said, yes. So, all right. So we just decided, uh, like on the Thursday, Friday it was, we're going to take over. And I, I couldn't tell Chester I was going to take over because he'd have it on the front page of the news. I said, Chester, you've got to come up in the morning. And I can't come up Saturday. I said, you've got to come up, only for an hour. You've got to come up. And so... I phoned all the owners um, and I phoned um, the TV first and said, but can I come on the TV? Can I just speak on the TV? Uh, why? I said, I just discussed today's runners. I couldn't tell him that because it was all news. And so uh, I phoned all the owners and I told all the owners, got quite a chance. I said, get me on every, I'm giving up. I'm retiring. David's taking up. Good. So that's what David Johnson said. So, <laughs> I thought, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm taking it yeah, up. Phoned that one. Um, yeah, good. <laughs> I was really upset. That's, that's all they could say. Good. I said, I just wanted to tell you because I'm going to announce it in a minute on the TV. So, good. Everybody said, good. And I said, um, 
Adam, David, David, I better go and tell Mum. My mother was still alive. She lived at the top of the drive. I said, we better go and tell Mum because I want it to appear on the TV. On the TV. So we dashed up to. I'm going to retire. Yeah, yeah. And had a few tears and then straight round to the yard. And I'm speaking on the on the TV. I said, AP was on the panel that day, and I just want to say that um, I'm retiring. Oh, and it was a complete shock to everybody. And Craig was uh, at home. He was ill. Uh, he watched it on the TV. And he immediately phoned somebody on the gaps. The travelling head lad. The travelling head lad. He said, um, the governor's retired. The governor's retired. Nobody in the yard knew. Nobody at, at all knew. Not, not even right. the secretaries. I just said, uh, that's how it came about. And, and, and so in some ways, Dave's really lucky. He's taken over sort of, you know, the champion trainer's stable, if you like. But in, in a lot of ways, he had a mountain to go. He was never going to be able to do what... You know, no one was ever going to be able to do what you did. Well, so. uh, you, you need the horses. Mm. And you need the ammunition. That's the most important thing. Um, but he did very well point yeah. pointing and he's doing very well. Yeah, did, he's it. already won the Grand National. Isn't mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, again, there's a funny story with the Grand National. <sighs> the jockey wrote it, Timmy Murphy wrote it, he said, it's no good. <laughs> he said, it's no good. And, and David said, I promise you, Dad, it's all right. What do I do? I said, he said, it's no good. I said, well, David, you've got to get Timmy Murphy at another meeting and somebody else to ride this horse. So he, he got Timmy Murphy to go to another meeting to ride another one of Mr. Johnson's. And I said, put anybody up, anybody that will do what you say, put anybody up. And I think it was Jimmy Frost he put up, and he nearly won the, uh, uh, the Ida at... Um, oh, yeah, Newcastle. At Newcastle, of course, then Timmy wanted to ride it. But we've got the note that says it's no good, get rid of. <laughs> but you used to make your jockeys write reports, didn't you? We still do. Um, they, they all write a report. Some jockeys in the olden days... Poor flat jockeys couldn't write reports, unbelievable, <laughs> honestly. Uh, Don't tell Jason Weaver that you'll go mad. No, I had re reports from everybody. Flat, the, some of the flat jockeys we did on the, um, on the telephone, <coughs> we'd write down everything, what they wore, and what they recommend. The most important part is not what happened today, not what happened today, you got beat, you won six lengths, which, 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 and so and so. What's going to happen next time? It's important to see, you know, you run it on the wrong track, it's got to go left handed, it's got to go right handed. You can't, I couldn't remember everything, so if you've got it in writing, you know. And the best jockey's report came from A.P. McCoy. The unbelievable jockey's report. He won the race at Banger, and he won, and we have a drink in the bar, celebrate afterwards. Only a very small race. And the jockey's report, I phoned the end the next day. I said, I've got bad news. What's the matter? Is, is the horse lame? Is it dead? Is something? I said, no, 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 the horse is OK. Everything's fine. It's just the jockey's report. Well, well, what's it say? It will never win again. Get rid of. <laughs> It's the only time he's ever put that. And, 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 and he said, you... we'll sell it, don't worry, we'll sell it and get another one. And it never won again. Did it? It, that was a, a, a very brave remark to put down. So, so you're still, are you still as involved in I retirement as you were? I still read all the jockey's reports and criticise everything. <laughs> a right pain in the backside, you're always there then, are you? You're right, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but I leave it all to David. David makes all the decisions. Um, and uh, it, it's... It's all in his, his hands now. Do you, do you wish you could make a comeback, though, secretly? Not really, no. It's very hard work. You've got to be very dedicated. Uh, it, it takes um, 24 hours a day. Mm. You're still living in quite a fast lane, aren't you? I still like it. I still like doing everything. Uh, as I say, I like going around the stables to see what they do. The building of the stables, again, is so important. How much light they get in the stables and everything like that. Everything can be improved. It can still be improved. Martin, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers.